Hey everyone, so this week we're starting to talk about a concept that is incredibly important to understand uh, all sorts of different outcomes in the American political process and system, and that is the concept of federalism. And I think to introduce this concept, to get us uh, really thinking about why we have a system like this and uh, how it was uh, initially sort of thought of, we need to go back to our constitutional conventions, plural, uh, in the American context. And particularly, I think about uh, the Articles of Confederation as a really important early document in the history of American uh, sort of politics. If you go back to it, you can see this in module two. I encourage you to read over those clauses and think really critically about what this is telling you. I know it's written in kind of old timey language, but uh, um, really this excerpt is a good way of uh, comparing and contrasting with the US Constitution. The sort of gist of the Articles of Confederation is that it was a, a surprisingly weak document. And it failed essentially because of coordination problems, where the Articles of Confederation did not fully bring the states together enough to be able to sort of protect each other and to provide uh, some of these common resources that are required uh, for the sort of 13 uh, colonies to become uh, a functioning uh, a nation with big, you know, scary, looming powers all around them. I mean, I think in the Genovian Convention, a little bit like um, the comparison is the, the triangle uh, country that's right to the to the east of Genovia, right? They've got thousands and thousands of soldiers. They're kind of a scary opponent, and so um, kind of this this idea, right? That's you know on the on the Gadsden flag and all these other um, uh, pieces of iconography of the American Revolution. Join or die is not just a flippant statement, right? It's this idea that without coordination across these different colonies, um, our nation is is not going to really be able to fend off foreign enemies. And so the Confederation, during the Articles of Confederation period, soon after the Declaration of Independence, uh, was really basically 13 independent states, right? 13 independent uh, nations, little mini-nations, who had, you know, loosely shared governance in a couple of different realms, especially economic and military affairs. And so by the time the sort of, um, you know, the, the Constitutional Convention came around, it was, uh, it was necessary to, to convene because states' economies were weak. Um, you know, many of the royalists, for example, uh, fled America and went to Canada. So a lot of the people who had a lot of resources, the former elites of these different colonies, sided with the British and said, sorry, I know you guys are trying to have your own revolution over here, but I stand to benefit from British rule. I am British subject, essentially, and I prefer being a subject to being um, a, a citizen of this new country. And so they took all their money and their resources and a lot of uh, their, you know, sort of trade connections with them when they left. So economies were weak. And, you know, one pivotal sort of uh, moment you can read about in the textbook is Shays' Rebellion, in which we actually had an insurrection, armed insurrection of sort of disgruntled uh, people in Western Massachusetts who almost brought down essentially the government of Massachusetts and caused the, um, you know, the delegations to the eventual constitutional convention. Uh, of 1787 to really think to themselves, hey, like th this mutual uh, protection scheme that we've sort of set up here is not working, right? We, they were unable to muster, um, you know, militias from other states to be able to come help quell this rebellion until it was almost too late. And so essentially the Articles of Confederation was too weak of a document in order to, to perpetuate some kind of, you know, a, a agreement among the states that would allow them to survive in this turbulent era. And so again, in 1787, the convention meets again. So these, these uh, delegates are selected from each state and they you know, all come together right, to Philadelphia to try to figure out a solution and to, to redo the articles. And so again, we've already talked about this in some other uh, slides and some other uh, sort of lecture content, but uh, we know that some elites in the U.S. were really afraid that the articles were allowing for too much democracy. Also, this idea that um, if, if sort of common, regular, ordinary people had too much say in the system, it would end up uh, essentially breaking because those people didn't have enough uh, knowledge of political you know, affairs to be able to make good decisions. Uh, and so part of this effort was to also sort of try to centrali central centralize and concentrate power uh, among some of the, the elite interests in each of these uh, states. And so we have this, this uh, setup, right, this, this opposition. Um, I know many people think of the, the framers of the Constitution or the so-called founding fathers as all being sort of completely homogenous and getting together and saying, ah, we'll draft a document that we'll all be able to sign, take a few days to write it all out because we're using pens and quills and we'll get it done. And this is going to be this sort of enduring document that we think is going to be perfect. Uh, 
Um, in fact, it was a political argument. It was a set of political debates and compromises that um, you know certainly resembles in many respects the Genovian simulation that we're doing over these uh, last few weeks. And one factor, one group of people at the convention who were really adamant about this po this this uh, fear, essentially, of sort of populist uprisings and the you know things like Shays' Rebellion, where you know common folk would sort of rise up and and destroy some of the institutions that they had already created. Um, these people we call the Federalists, essentially. So Federalists were interested in creating a stronger centralized government. They wanted to make sure that that centralized government uh, preserved some of the ability of sort of elites to lead in that society. But if we look at anti-federalists who existed in essentially all the colonies, there was some you know, anti-federalist sentiment that had bubbled up over this period. Um, but especially in places like Rhode Island and North Carolina, you had skeptics, essentially, of this federalist project, where they said, look, we're a little bit worried about the possibility of the opposite phenomenon happening, where if power becomes too centralized and we start to have a strong you know, federal or national level government that's going to tell all the states what to do, um, we might end up having, a, 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 we might backslide into authoritarianism. Right? We talked about the differences between authoritarianism and sort of limited constitutional government. One central figurehead could, you know, take over essentially, and we'd end up having a, a country that would be ruled by a very, very small elite few um, instead of, you know, power to the people, essentially, you know, something that was set out in the Declaration of Independence as kind of a core, a core uh, uh, principle. And if you think about it, this is not an idle, empty kind of threat here at the time, right? Um, nor has it ever been an idle, empty threat. Right? The possibility of a single individual or a few individuals concentrating power and essentially eroding democracy is a really scary thing um, in, in democracies across the world. I mean, you need to you need only think about the fact that, you know, when the U.S. was going to war in 1812 with the British, right? Um, they were going to war with a constitutional monarchy. But they also were thinking about in the background, right? A lot of these political debates at that time were centered on the fear of uh, a Napoleonic kind of uh, uh, government sweeping in. And so uh, the French at the time were in, involved in a completely absolutist government, essentially this, this, this hyper-authoritarian uh, sort of military dictatorship, essentially, that Napoleon had created. And so if we look across the, the world, right, you know, after the French had had their own sort of, you know, dem you know, democratic revolution, we see that there was an instance in which an authoritarian seized power quite quickly. Um, and so Americans at the time were very worried about both possibilities, right? Populist, you know, over, you know, running over um, democratic institutions and the idea of a quote unquote mobocracy or an, a, on the opposite side, right? This, this hyper centralized government becoming a vehicle for a single individual uh, to take despotic power over the country. And so the Federalists, um, however, were, were people who, you know, I think made a lot of very uh, impassioned arguments through a series of uh, different letters that were sort of passed around uh, to printed in various Federalist newspapers um, and widely read by members of the convention. Um, they were they made a really impassioned case. This is what we call the Federalist Papers um, in trying to demand these sort of stronger governmental institutions. While again, anti-Federalists, and there were a series of letters that were less widely um, read and certainly are less widely read today, uh, but sort of anti-Federalist counter-arguments um, saying that overreach into sort of citizens' rights might be a natural outgrowth of some of these, uh, some of these features of a stronger centralized government. So after the, the Constitutional Convention concluded, uh, one of the things that was still outstanding as a sort of important task for the, the members of the convention was to pass this document to the states for ratification, essentially for approval. And so this ratification process required the, uh, the state delegations, the state legislatures, essentially, to decide whether or not this was a document that they'd be willing to sort of uh, adopt. And so there was strong resistance to many, uh, by many states that had anti-federalist uh, majorities because they read this, this text and they said, hey, some of these features, things like the supremacy clause, right? this is a pretty uh, federalist kind of document. This is a document that sets up you know, much more uh, national integration and coordination at this federal level compared to you know, the previous iteration, the, the uh, Articles of Confederation, where really the states were kind of the central units of political autonomy. And so they resisted this stuff. Um, and so some of the debates that anti-federalists had with federalists at the time um, were things like guaranteed rights for both states and individuals. 
And so we're going to talk much more about this uh, next week, but um, the Anti-Federalists did succeed in trying to in implement um, 10 amendments. Eventually, 10 would be, would be, um, would be passed. 10 amendments to the text almost, almost instantaneously after this ratification process called the Bill of Rights. Um, and so this, this uh, set of amendments, changes to the text of the Constitution um, that were almost immediately proposed, uh, allowed essentially for this to become less of a bitter pill for anti-federalists to swallow, especially things like the Tenth Amendment, which re which reserve powers to the states, uh, and some of the other amendments, which are about individual uh, guarantees and liberties. Uh, there's also the the process of amendment itself, right? That we need to talk about. Uh, it's a very difficult process. Uh, I've got a couple of slides here um, that sort of show in Article Five of the Constitution how this actually works. There's a couple of different routes. You can see this in the textbook as well. Uh, the proposal of amendments, the ratification of amendments. Uh, you can either do this right through passage in the House and Senate by a two-thirds vote or a national convention called by Congress. So uh, another constitutional convention essentially could be called uh, at any time uh, in response to uh, petitions that have been signed by two-thirds of the states. So you can see that there's a little asterisk down here that says this method has never been employed. Um, and the method, uh, amendment routes three and four have never even been attempted. And so uh, that is something that is a possibility according to the constitutional language, but has never been uh, been employed. And so this uh, amendment process, right, the, the beginning routes one and, you know, one and two, essentially beginning through passage in the House and Senate by two thirds vote, mm -hmm. is essentially the way that the constitution has been amended uh, thus far. So just a, a minor detail about that. Um, but really, the, the last thing that I want to do in this short video is really give you a feel for the consequences of how the Articles of Confederation stacks up against the U.S. Constitution. As you can see, for example, uh, having seen just now that amendment process, Articles of Confederation required all states to agree, or state delegations to agree in unanimity uh, to, to change the Articles. You can see that the Constitution's amendment process we just saw in that, uh, in that image was not unanimous. The legislature, the, the Articles of Confederation had like an incredibly weak unicameral legislature with just essentially the, that convention that kept getting called back, kind of like the, the Genovian group um, constantly summoned um, to uh, respond to sort of pressing issues. Constitution obviously employs this bicameral solution to the Connecticut Compromise. That's really important to think about. Uh, Articles of Confederation also did not have any real provision for an executive that is like a president and no judiciary really um, uh, uh, talked about in that document. Whereas the Constitution, though there's limited discussion of this last piece in, the, in this article uh, about the judiciary, uh, it still has a lot more to say about how the judiciary should be set up. Uh, in terms of representation, you can see that this bicameral solution also balances the needs and interests of sort of large states versus small states, as we talked about last week. Um, also, this is a really important point here, veto points. The U.S. Constitution has many veto points, in fact. It has many places. Veto points are essentially places where if you're trying to pass legislation, if you're trying to make new rules about how uh, the government should function, there's many different places where those rules can be thwarted or essentially prevented from passing. And so with our system of checks and balances, we've got the possibility that the president, we, that one or the other member, uh, chamber of Congress uh, can essentially put a uh, stop to any legislation being passed. There's also, uh, the Supreme Court interpreted its role in uh, making uh, uh, judgments about the constitutionality, even of legislation. And so there's a lot of veto points in the Constitution, whereas in the Articles of Confederation, there's not much there in terms of that sophisticated thinking about how to slow down legislation from sort of barreling its way through the process and really changing the way people live their lives. And then finally, we think about supremacy. This is the big thing I want to think about this week as we get into our discussion of federalism, this, this key topic, is that the Articles of Confederation, really, there wasn't much in, by way of a statement that the federal government was supreme over, or you know, the, the, the uh, confederational, confederational government, you might say, was supreme over the states. Really, the states were the ones that had most of the power um, in this arrangement. Whereas with the Constitution, we have this very particular uh, clause called the, Supre the Supremacy Clause, which makes this explicit statement that laws passed by Congress are supreme over the states. And if the states um, have laws that are sort of conflicting, right, that are, that are countervailing to the, to the national level uh, legislation, then essentially the states are going to need to reform um, to, to uh, be in, in compliance, essentially, with the federal policies. And so here we have a big difference. The Constitution is now, as we can see, a much more federalist document. Um, however, 
This is a really key point and why I wanted to introduce this by talking about this, this explicit comparison. The U.S. Constitution, while federal, is not a unitary government. It's not a government that does away with states as relevant and powerful units of political power. And so as we get into our discussion in just a moment about federalism proper, we need to think about this mindset. Uh, really, uh, I think we need to keep this in our heads that the U.S. Constitution still holds in its design the vestiges of this previous system in which states essentially were the, the organs of power. And so we have a multi-layered governmental system where states still control a lot of the decisions that determine who gets what, where, and how in our daily lives, despite the fact that we do have this strong and increasingly strong, um, over time, federal governmental structure. So that's all for this uh, video. I will see you all in the next one.